Good morning, everybody. It's good to see everybody. Um, you're stuck with me today. Sorry. I, you know, I was telling, yeah, thanks, Jackie. I appreciate that. I have one fan in the crowd. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, what's that? One is better than zero. That's true. One is a lot better than zero. Um, you know, we, we, what we said is we decided to, you know, to announce that it was going to be Josh and Amy, so that way people would come, you know? And then it's just a trick because it's just me. So I know, I know, what a bummer. I hear it all the time. You know, when people start telling me, they're like, you know, I, I'll be somewhere. And they're like, well, hi, Josh, but where's your wife and kids? You know, and I'm like, I can't just come by, you know, by myself places anymore. Like, it has to be, there she is. She made a triumphal entrance here, you know. So, yeah, I know. that You dismissed it. Everybody was, like, booing me off stage here, you know, so. Um, okay, so we're going to walk through a couple things today. Um, I want us to review our theme a little bit. So, first of all, <laughs> goes without saying that 2020 has been like, you know, trying to run a mile with your shoelaces tied together, right? So, I, it's, it's been awful, right? <laughs> I'll just say that, just everything that's going on. And I was like thinking about it, and I'm like, wait. Are the killer hornets still a thing? Like, are they, is that still, like, I mean, should I be aware? Should I be, like, spraying myself with, like, the hornet repellent or whatever, you know? I don't know. I mean, I just remember that being a thing, too, and I'm just like, <laughs> yeah, I shouldn't do that, should I? Yeah, that's probably not good for me. Um, but uh, it's just been a lot in the last few months, a lot. And so I want to kind of, kind of come back to what we feel like God's called us to be about, Okay. So we felt as, you know, a church body here that God was calling us to action. God was calling us to start walking in lots of different ways. And I don't know if you guys remember my lovely drawing abilities with my triangle. I don't know if you guys remember that. <laughs> I think about that and I'm like, that was really <laughs> bad. But um, we talked about the triangle, which was the up, the in, and the out. Okay? Up means walking with. God, in means walking with each other, and out means walking with people who don't know Jesus, right? So all three relationships are super, super important. And it's, it's hard to focus on all three of those things um, kind of at the same time, right? That's kind of hard. Someone did it perfectly. It was Jesus. He walked perfectly with the up relationship with the Father with the in peace with his disciples, and then the out peace. We see that a lot in the, in the, in the Bible. So um, our example of walking in those three areas is how Jesus did, okay? Um, so then we, as quarantine started and, um, you know, the online services kind of happened and all of that, we talked about... Um, we talked about walking, excuse me, come walk with me in the Psalms, which I was like, oh, that's a cool little twist on it, right? So we're focusing on Psalms, but it also has the come walk with me still tied to it, okay? So we're going to continue that today. We're going to continue walking in a Psalm that's just been on my heart, and we're going to talk about what that means in relation to the come walk with me, okay? So let's talk about Psalms. Most of the Psalms were written by who? David. Okay? So let's talk about David. All right? Now, what's the, what's the story that comes to everybody's mind when we think of David? David and Goliath. Right? My, uh, if, you, if your kids don't watch Right Now Media, they're missing out because Right Now Media is one of the coolest. Right, Lucas? You like Right Now Media? Yep. And Levi? Yep. Okay. Superbook, and there's a lot of other things in there. So they they love those. Yep, Bible Man. I mean, literally, I, I don't know if you've ever been in the kids section. There's literally like 75 kids series in there. So it's amazing. You should check it out, even if you're an adult. It's, they're cool to watch. Um, one of the one of the um, programs in there is called Heroes of the Bible, and Heroes of the Bible it talks about David being a hero of the Bible. Would, is it safe to say that David was a hero of the Bible? Yeah, 
that's really safe to say, right? And uh, so I just kind of want to run through. I was just kind of leafing back through the story of David, like the long story of David, just to pull out some highlights. So I want to pull out some highlights for you, okay? So um, David was a shepherd. He was the youngest of all of his brothers, okay? So Joel's the youngest. We always look down on him like they look down at David. Okay, no, Joel. You feel his pain. You, that's why your middle name is David, right? Isn't that what it is? Okay. So shep- or he was a shepherd, okay? And when Samuel came to anoint the new king, um, Samuel, all Samuel knew that God said is go to Jesse, and he's got tons of sons, okay? It's basically like going to Dennis Anwell and saying, one of your 74 sons is, uh, is going to be king, okay? So, and it's the youngest, right, David? There you go, right? Yeah, you're welcome, okay? So, you know, Samuel gets there, and, you know, there's the oldest one. You got the Gabe of the family, and, you know, he's the strapping, you know, like, muscular army cool guy, you know, whatever. And, and Sam is like, obviously, this is the one, right? And God says, nope. And what actually God says is, people judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. We've heard that before, right? The Lord looks at the heart. So he said, nope, Gabe's not the one. Bring Nate in, and they're like, whoa, that's really not the one, right? No, I'm just kidding. He's not even here to defend himself, you know? He's not even here to defend himself. But then you've got, so they went on and on down the line through all of his brothers. And then, you know, Samuel's like, no, none of these are, this is all your kids? This is all the the sons you have? And he's like, well, I got the little one. He's out in the field. We didn't think it was important for him to come in. Samuel's like, "Go go get that one. So he goes, brings him in. It's little David, okay, little scrawny David, shepherd boy. God's like, yep, that's him, okay? So David gets anointed as a young boy as king, okay? Like he's going to become ki- uh, the king in the future. Um, then a little while later, he was requested by Saul, who was the king at that time. Saul was, like, tormented with, like, these crazy feelings and emotions and whatever, And to calm him down, they were like, bring David. He's a harp player. He plays a harp. So he's like, bring David in, and he'll, you know, play some music, and it'll be nice and soothing for you. Okay? It'll help you out. Okay? Great. Great, right? So he does that. Okay? So David's in there helping Saul calm down and all that stuff. Then it comes, goes into the story of David and Goliath. Okay? Where all of a sudden, David just jumps to the forefront, and he's like, hi, I'm little, and I just um, beat this huge giant that none of you could defeat. Okay? He doesn't say it that way, but that's the truth, right? Um, I kept leafing through the, the passages there in, in 1 Samuel, and it said a couple quotes in here. First one said, whatever Saul asked David to do, David did it successfully. Every single thing that Saul asked David to do, he did it successfully. Okay? It's like, hey, David, there's this really hard problem. Can you go look at that? Sure. Done. Success. Everything. Next thing it says, um, quote from 1 Samuel 18, verse 14. David continued to succeed in everything he did, for the Lord was with him. The Lord was with him everywhere. Everything he did was successful. I mean, we're looking like perfect child, right, coming up. I mean, literally, he's basically a Japheth is what it is, you know? Right, Japheth, perfect child? Okay, all right. Yep, basically. Um... So after David became king then, because David became king, he continued to be successful at everything. But all of a sudden, he was a military leader. So he captured Jerusalem. He beat the Philistines. Like, it just goes on and on and on about all these successes that David has, not only with being a a musician, not only with taking care of, you know, the family and the farm and stuff like that, all of a sudden, now he's a successful leader in the, in the, in the military. He can't lose. Um, I actually want to go into 2 Samuel uh, chapter 7. So grab your Bibles and do that. Dave asked me if I wanted stuff up on the screen today, and I said, nope, Dave, I don't necessarily. And he goes, oh, we're going old school today. So we're going old school for everybody. 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel. Chapter 7, verse, starting at verse 8, okay? This is a promise 
that God is making to David after all these successes, okay? So he says, starting at uh, chapter 7, verse 8, Now go and say to my servant David, he's sending in through a prophet, uh, This is what the Lord of heaven's army says, Declared, I took you from tending sheep in the pasture and selected you to be the leader of my people Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone, and I have destroyed all your enemies before your eyes. Now I will make your name as famous as anyone who has ever lived on the earth. Uh, and I'll provide a homeland for my people Israel. We're going to skip down here. Um, end of verse 11 says, and I will give you rest from all your enemies. Next paragraph starts out with, furthermore, the Lord declares that he will make a house for you, a dynasty of kings. Now, let's say someone came up to you and said, God said that you've been successful with everything because he's been with you. And you're going to be the most famous person in the world. You're going to sit on the throne for the rest of your life. And your entire family will have a dynasty of kings. Like, that's what that's saying. Like, holy cow, this David guy is like from like zero to hero in throughout his life so far. Am I right? Okay. This guy is the man. He's successful in, in absolutely everything. Absolutely everything. And... To this point, it doesn't even look like he sinned at all. Am I right? Okay, so you're looking at David and you're like thinking like, holy cow, I'm super intimidated by this guy because he can do all this stuff. So let's talk about if David were living in Couts, Indiana or in northwest Indiana right now. Who would David be? Maybe a successful businessman? Maybe a leader in the military, in our military, who's going out and fighting wars. Maybe he's a really successful musician. Maybe he's like a prominent pastor or maybe even president. Okay? Do we see how he could have filled all those roles? Do we, do we see how we compare those roles today with what David would have been in that time? Okay, all these huge positions that were on his shoulders. And on top of all that, he was the most famous person in the world. Okay. So let's move on. Let's go to chapter 11. What's coming up in chapter 11? What does your title say on chapter 11? Oh, 2 Samuel chapter 11. Bathsheba. Dun, dun, dun. Oh, man. Here's where it gets interesting. So I'm going to paraphrase the story a little bit for you because it's kind of a long story for those of you who don't know it. David, Mr. King, Mr. Awesome, okay? The, uh, yeah, no, has done no wrong, right? He's out on his porch in his palace. He sees a woman bathing. Okay, and he is attracted to her. So he uses his kingly right to find out who she is, finds out that she's married to a guy named Uriah. And so he, but he finds out, he knows that Uriah is out fighting battle. So Uriah is not around. So what does David do? He calls for Bathsheba. Hey, I need to talk to you about something. Okay, brings Bathsheba in. He ends up sleeping with her. And she's pregnant, okay? So, all of a sudden, David's got a situation. He has just taken a, a married woman and gotten her pregnant, and now he's got to cover it up. So what does he do? He starts scheming, and he's like, okay, okay, here's what I'm going to do. Oh, I'm going to bring Uriah to the house or to the palace. I'm going to get him nice and drunk and tell him to go home and be with your wife because you've earned it. And hopefully people will put it together that that's Uriah's kid. Okay, that's plan one. All right, so brings Uriah in. Uriah, you're awesome. I'm going to give you a little break from the military. You've been working real hard, blah, blah, blah. Go home, relax, enjoy time with your wife, blah, 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 right? What does Uriah say? What does he say? Anybody know? He says no. He is so loyal to King David that he's like, no, none of my other fellow soldiers can be here 
hanging out in their own houses, being with their wives. I'm not going to do that. So he, like, sleeps in the streets because he's, like, so loyal. And King David's like, ooh, this guy would be awesome if I wasn't trying to cover this up. Okay? So all of a sudden David's like, okay, plan number two. Plan number two, what do I do here? What do I do? I've got to get rid of this Uriah guy. He's like, I got it. Know what I'm going to do. I'm going to send him back to where he was fighting in the war. I'm going to send a message to his supervisor or his, what do you call it? That's it, okay, to his general, all right? And tell him, hey, send Uriah to the very front and then back everyone else off. Have Uriah go one on all of them. Impossible, right? So, obviously, the general says, general? Is that what we said? General? Yeah, the leader guy, okay? He says, I got to do what the king's commanded me to, so he does it. Uriah, go out there, fight, ready, go, and we'll stand here and watch you die. That's basically what happened. So Uriah dies. And what does David do? He brings Bathsheba in as his wife. Poor Bathsheba. I'll bring her in as another one of my wives, okay? So he thinks all is kind of swept under the rug until God says, can't sweep anything under the rug for me. And God says, Nathan, the prophet, go talk to him and tell him, you know, this. Tells him a story. Um, And before I get too far here, let me make sure. Well, let me back up for a second. So we know from that story that David was a liar. David was lustful. He was manipulative. He used his power in a wrong way. And he was a murderer. But this is David, remember? Zero to hero. And look what happened. So God sends out Nathan, like I said, to tell David, like, dude, we know what's going on here. Okay? And calls out David and says, surely you have done this and this is not right. Okay? And all of a sudden David's exposed. His sin is exposed. Okay? Um... Now we're going to get to Psalms. So I'd like everyone to keep um, your thumb kind of there, but we're going to turn to Psalms 51. Psalms 51. I I know we've all heard this psalm before, I feel like, but I want us I wanted to give a lot of context before reading this. This is, the title of this psalm says, this is what David cried out to God saying when he was called out by Nathan with what he had done with Bathsheba and Uriah. Okay? This is David's response after he had realized, God knows my whole sin. He knows everything. So I'm just going to read this. Have mercy on me, O God, because of your unfailing love. Because of your great compassion, blot out the stain of my sins. Wash me clean from my guilt. Purify me from my sin. For I recognize my rebellion. It haunts me day and night. Against you and you alone have I sinned. I have done what is evil in your sight. You will be proved right in what you say. And your judgment against me is just. For I was born a sinner. Yes, from the moment my mother conceived me, but you desire honesty from the womb, teaching me wisdom even there. Purify me from my sins, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Oh, give me back my joy again. You have broken me. Now let me rejoice. Don't keep looking at my sins. Remove the stain of my guilt and create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a loyal spirit within me. Do not banish me from your presence, and don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and make me willing to obey you. Then I will teach your ways to rebels, and they will return to you. 
Forgive me for shedding blood, O God who saves. Then I will joyfully sing of your forgiveness. Unseal my lips, O Lord, that my mouth may praise you. You do not desire a sacrifice or I would offer one. You do not want a burnt offering. The sacrifice you desire is a broken spirit. You will not reject a broken and repentant heart, O oh God. I'm going rep- I'm going to repeat that verse 17 because I think that's super important. It says, "The sacrifice you desire is a what? A broken spirit." You will not reject a broken and repentant heart, O oh God. I think it's really interesting because what does it say God desires? He desires a broken spirit. It doesn't say that it's just acceptable, like when we are broken and we realize the weight of our sin. It's not just okay to come to God with that, but he wants it. He wants that. He wants a broken spirit in us. And I think the reason is, is because it shows our need for him. If we truly come with a broken spirit like David did after his sin and after he was fully exposed to God, like how much did David need God in his life in that moment? A lot. This is kind of where we realize that no matter how good we are or how good we try to be, we still fail. Mr. Zero to Hero still failed. The most famous guy in the world failed hardcore. Right? But I want us to realize, too, that out of, you can kind of read in that Psalms, how raw David was, right? There wasn't really, he didn't really hold anything back when it came to that psalm. He was like super, like, you can feel the desperation in it. Can't you? Can't you feel that? And what that shows to me is it's like, out of our rawness comes real worship. When we, are, when we choose to be humble and to completely humble ourselves and say, God, here's me. This is what's going on. Here's me. That's when true worship and raw worship really flows out of us. Right? So the question, again, I'm just going to throw challenge questions out. You guys know I'm good at that, right? I just like, I, I don't know the answers to anything. I just <laughs> throw them out to you guys and like, you deal with it, okay? I don't really know the answer. So my question is, are we fully exposed before God? Are we fully exposed before God? That's the question for all of us. And when we are expressing ourselves to God, do we have a broken spirit? Are we to the point where we can express true, raw worship because of our brokenness? Again, just another question. So now, I want to switch gears a a tiny bit. So we talk about us walking with God like David walked with God, his experience, right? I want to switch gears just a little bit. So I want to give you a scenario There's a really godly, successful businessman that lives in Couts, okay? The guy has done so many awesome things, okay? He has like, man, he's just super involved. He's blessed so many people. He's been super successful at everything he's done. And everyone's like, man, I want to be like that guy. Okay, he's super godly guy who just is like, man, he's got it all together. 
All of a sudden, he has an affair with one of his employee's wives. Then to cover it up, he makes up a story about the employee, that something wrong that they did, and then gets the employee fired. Now what do we think? <laughs> How easy is it for us to say, oh my gosh, that guy's evil. That guy's evil. How dare he do that? His whole life has been a lie. He's been lying his whole life about this. You can't trust that guy. No way. You can't trust that guy. And he should lose his job for what he did. He should lose his job. It's not fair. That is not fair. Does that story sound familiar to what we just talked about? I didn't even talk about the murder piece. Like, here we go. We're going to go there. We're really going to go there. Because <laughs> we've got to think about the way we look at people around us. We're supposed to have a different worldview. Right? One of uh, a really famous verse that I really like, Romans 3.23. What's the first four words? For all have sinned. For all have sinned. Did it say for all sinned except David? Did it say for all have sinned except Cody Tradebus? I think that's what my version says. Is it? No? Oh, okay. <laughs> Tori's like, nope. Not true, okay? <laughs> Not true. But it says, for all have sinned. So you ready for another challenge question? Is it okay to let people know we're not perfect? Is it okay that people know that we're not perfect? <laughs> uh, yesterday, Lucas, or I, don't, I can't remember if it was Lucas or Levi, Lucas, he comes up to me and Amisa Dai and he's like, Dad, what's a show off? <laughs> oh, man. And so he explained what a show off was. You, I don't need to give the explanation, do I? Do I? Okay, you all know what a show off is. Uh, <laughs> but what it reminds me of is the Pharisees in the Bible. Okay, for those of you who don't know who the Pharisees were, they were the religious leaders. So that would be like the pastors of our day, the elders of our day. Okay, so these pastors and elders walked around like, we know what we're doing, and you don't. Okay, that's how they walked around. We know the scriptures. You want to hear um, Genesis 4, 21 through 17, the, which version would you like? And they could rattle it off. Okay? They're show offs. They're show offs. And guess what? Jesus had a lot of run ins with them. A lot of run ins with them. You know, I, um, we have a friend that my wife and I are really good friends with. And um, she, we, have been, we have been just talking with her for a really long time about who Jesus is, and she, she just, she has so many qualities of who Jesus is, it's not even funny, um, but yet she's still not to that point where she's like a full devoted follower of Jesus, okay? So, Amisa Dina, or I was there at their house with a, some other people there one night, and we were just talking, and we were just talking about, you know, who Jesus is to us and things like that, and I just, I told her, I said, I my life is a complete mess <laughs> because ask my wife it is it is um there's so much in my life that is not good there's so much in my life that I have to 
I have to constantly ask forgiveness for, for my actions. I mean, I know I'm the perfect husband, but uh, she's nodding her head. I'll take that as a win, okay? But I, I just told her, I was like, I'm a mess. <laughs> my life is a mess, and that's why I need Jesus in my life. You know, I'm a mess. And a week later, uh, one of my other friends came up to me, and she's like, you, like, really threw her off. I was like, what do you mean? And she's like, well, she just thinks your life is perfect. And I was like, oh, no. If someone thinks my life is perfect, what, what is that saying? Am I acting like a Pharisee? Oof. Now I'm like, oh, shoot. This is where it gets messy. Because guess what? I've got to show that I'm not perfect. We don't do that here. In these walls, we are all perfect people. Right? At least Cody is. We already established that. Okay? Tori thinks so, too. Um, I heard a quote from a guy when I was just looking up stuff on YouTube. And he said, being a Christian isn't about pretending that you're good. It's admitting that you're bad. No. It doesn't say it's about knowing that you're bad. It says admitting that you're bad. And again, that's a quote. That's not from scripture, but that's a quote from somebody. But do you see a difference between knowing and admitting? Big difference between knowing and admitting. And it requires us to go from perfect status to I need Jesus status. Right? So, <laughs> who should we as Christians be known as? The ones who have it all together or the ones who need Jesus the most? Do we feel like we need Jesus more than the unsaved person? Do we feel that way? So many times we're like, we're out here to show people the way because we know it. Well, yeah, we know the way is Jesus. But I think sometimes we take that out of context a little bit. Where it's like, guess what? I need him like crazy. I don't know where you're at, but I need him like crazy. Um, I thought about all the different Bible characters that we think of as pillars in the Bible. We've all talked about this before. Jonah. What do we think about? Jonah and the whale. He was inside the whale and blah, blah, blah. Why was he inside the whale? Because he had disobeyed. Think about Moses. God came to Moses and he was like, Moses, guess what? You're going to go to the most powerful person in your area and tell him to set up free all the slaves and everything will be great. And Moses is like, okay, let's go. What does Moses say? No way, Jose. Disobedience? Ended up doing something really great, right? The disciples, the closest people to Jesus. We talked about this in our Easter experience as well. The disciples were like the first people to be like, don't know the guy. Right? Did they do great things? Did the disciples do awesome things and witness some really cool things? Yeah. But did they, did they screw up? Yes, they did. We even see one of the biggest writers in Scripture is, anybody know? Paul. Let's talk about Paul for a second. Everybody grab your Bibles and let's go to 1 Timothy. All the way back, 1 Timothy. I have a feeling some of you know where I'm going with this. 1 Timothy, it's right after Thessalonians. It's like a two-page book, so it's impossible to find. Um, 1 Timothy, we're going to do verse or chapter 1, verse 15. Okay? 
This says, this is Paul talking. Again, one of the ones who wrote the most amount of scripture that we have today that we follow. Timothy says, or excuse me, Saul, Paul says, oh my gosh. Verse 15, this is a trustworthy saying and everyone should accept it. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners and I am the worst of all. So Paul, who's telling us how to live like Jesus, is saying, guess what? I don't care what you've done, I've done worse. Anything you can do, I can do worse. Here's the part that I was like a huge light bulb moment for me, though. Don't stop reading there. Let's go to verse 16. But God had mercy on me so that Christ Jesus could use me as a prime example of his great patience with even the worst sinners. So Paul, hero in scripture, was the worst of all sinners, but he admitted so, so that God could use him as the prime example of what mercy looks like. <laughs> Remember we talked about Romans 3.23? For all have sinned. What's the last part of that? But the gift of God is through Jesus Christ. Everybody has sinned, but everyone has the gift. So do we see how God walked with David during those times that were sinful? During those times where he kind of rebelled? And during those times where he was weak? Do we see that? So if we want to be like Jesus, are we willing to walk with each other through that same stuff? If our goal is to look like Jesus, that means Jesus walked, walks through with us all of our crap. So now our goal is to say, because I want to be like Jesus, I want to walk through crap with everybody else. That's what it's about. Walking with people. Messy. Now, here's the other question, and I'm going to read this because I wanted to phrase this correctly. Are we willing to non-judgmentally point people to the one that David cried out to and said, make me as white as snow, remove the stain of my guilt, and create in me a clean heart? Can we... As people who believe we need Jesus the most, point people to him and be like, guess what? That's the guy. That's the guy who will clean you. That's the guy who takes away all your guilt. That's the guy who takes away all your shame. He's the one. It's not me. And I know you're carrying it. Are we willing to do that? in a non-judgmental way where we say, I'm going to walk through it with you, but we're heading that way. Because he's the one that accepts a broken spirit. I want to kind of end with a couple things here. Um, and then we're going to just end with a song. Um, my wife's going to come up and save the day here after this. Um, so we talked about two different sides of this. The walking with God. Through sin. Through highs and lows. With a spirit of humility that understands our need for Jesus. 
and then walking with others, we have got to get it ingrained in our brain that all have sinned. We have to. We have to get it in our minds. All have sinned. And I'm not talking about I kicked a piece of property that wasn't mine. Do we realize how big sin is right now? Sin is huge in people's lives. So I'm not talking about the just the little sins, the easy ones. All have sinned, and I like to add big on the end of that. All have sinned big. So our challenge is to come with a broken spirit, to, with a humble heart, and to love and walk with others the way that Jesus would. Yeah? We understand that? My wife's going to share one quick story, um, and then she's going to pray for us. So many of you or some of you know that uh, in our home, we, we have been doing construction. And so it's been fun, let me tell you. Um, but um, so our house is really messy right now. And uh, there's a lot of going on in our house. And I don't think what... Uh, it, maybe some of you know because have experienced construction being at home, you know, uh, but you don't know where to start or where to finish or all those projects. So we're in that process. So um, we're bringing carpet in here soon in the rooms that we're building. And Josh told me we need to take those two tiles uh, because it will be like on the way from, you know, whatever or carpet. So I'm like, I got this. I can do this, you know. So uh, we were already tired because we had a full morning. And I was saying, I'm just going to sit down on the ground. And I'm going to be, you know, hurting or not hurting, like kicking hard. I don't know how to say it. But those tiles are going to come off. Because if I did not accomplish something today, this is going to be my goal. And I'm going to accomplish that. Anyways, so later that I know... It was more than my strength, you know. It was more than what I thought I can get it done. And I started getting frustrated and frustrated. And I keep just going like, oh, no, I'm going to do it, you know. And there were times that I was just going like, you're coming out now, you know. And there were times that I would just go like, tick, tick, I'm tired. I cannot do this. I'm sure there's a chemical. I'm sure there's something that I can use to make it better than this. But then again and again, I would try it to get it done, right? Because I had a goal in mind. But I was done for the day and I was frustrated. And not all the time, it's my first reaction. But what I decided to do is to put worship songs. And the funny thing in my Pandora, you know, radio, is that every song that it was playing, it was about facing a bottle. And now I'm not a singer, but I was singing loud and clear because maybe I was facing two little tiles that I needed to take off, but I knew in life when I face a bottle is Jesus always in my life. And the best thing is that when we always put Jesus in front, things look different. And I will show you. Let's just think. Family, yourself, marriage, sin, school, work, business, valleys, highs. I'm just telling you words. But see the difference if I say, Jesus, family. Jesus, sin. Jesus, myself. If I put Jesus ahead of the word that I'm trying to describe, it changed completely the definition of that word. Do you see what I'm saying? Because I don't see only family, but I see Jesus in my family. But I, because I don't only see sin, I see Jesus through my sin. 
We have to bring Jesus in our life every time. No, faith, no, no matter if you're facing something small at two tiles or you're facing something bigger than that. When is Jesus always ahead of you, in front of you, he will show you the way. And as we walk with God, he will show us the way. As we walk us together as a body, he will show us the way because he's in front of us. As we walk with others, if we say, Jesus, neighbor, I guarantee you, you will see your neighbor different. Because it's him who covers all. That makes sense? Can we pray this morning? Father, thank you. Thank you because it's your grace, it's your love, it's your mercy that we can enjoy every morning. Because sometimes even when I worry, you are a step ahead of me already taking care of things. Father, even when I fear, you are already a step ahead of me taking care of things. Even when I sin, you are already a step ahead of me. And Father, it's your love who covers all. It's your presence that we need every day. It's you who we need, Jesus. So Father, we put Jesus first. We put Jesus first. And everything that we are, and everything that we do, everything that we say, so it's you, Jesus, for your glory. We honor your name. We honor your name and who you are. And Father, as we keep walking this week, show us more and more how to have that the broken spirit to come humble to you. So only you can be show wherever we go. Help us to be more with a humble heart. So Others can only see you through us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. I just want to share this. I, I was reading uh, when Josh went to uh, the First Timothy passage. The First Timothy passage out of the message says this. Here's a word you can take to heart and depend on. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. I'm proof. Public sinner number one of someone who could never have made it apart from sheer mercy. And now he shows me, shows me off. Now, it's interesting because our idea is that we, when we're trying to be a witness, we need to be the person that kind of, as Josh said, talked about having it all together and so on. Well, he goes on to say, and this is out of, again, this is out of the message. And, he, and now he shows me off evidence of his endless patience to those who are right on the edge of trusting him forever. He shows us off. What does he show off? He shows off his endless patience with us. So that that person that's right on the edge of trusting him forever can sit there and say, oh, I get it. You don't have to be perfect with this thing just have to trust on the mercy of God. just thought that was a good, uh, I like that uh, paraphrase.